Hello, hello, what is up everybody? This is Ruben and I'm back with another Ruben Report. For today's video, I wanted to make a compilation or a grand summary of my entire journey with the valve recession issues that I've been experiencing with my motorcycle up to this point. Um, I know in the most recent past couple months or even the past couple weeks, there's been lots of posts, lots of traffic within the group, and lots of opinions, lots of conversations about the valve recession topic for the RX-3. And especially for those out there who are uh, owners of RX-3s or even potential owners of RX-3s, you might be wondering, what is this issue all about, right? And I know that it's quite daunting to have to literally sift through over 80 different YouTube videos that I posted or over 90 different Facebook posts that I've posted. And any one particular post, you may find certain comments or just a piece of the story instead of having the full picture. So in this video today, I wanted to, again, summarize um, everything we know about the issue so far just to kind of get everybody up to speed so that there is clarity and everyone understands the full picture of what has been going on up to this point this will be your one-stop shop for everything valve recession <laughs> uh, related with this motorcycle so i hope that this is going to be very helpful to you and this video is going to be quite a lengthy video, understandably. Uh, but if there's a specific topic that is interesting to you, I will have uh, links listed below. Just like a lot of my other very lengthy videos, I'm going to have um, the links for all the resources and I'm going to have timestamps listed below so you can fast forward to any one specific section. Okay. All right. So let's get started. All right, in this section of the video, we're going to be answering a couple of simple questions. To start things off, we're going to be answering, what is valve recession? What usually causes valve recession? And also, what makes valve recession so dangerous? Now, if you do a simple Google search on the issue, you're going to find a plethora of information out there on the Internet. I don't want to make things too difficult. I don't want to overwhelm you. Um, but I have found a extensive research article on the topic that will give us a clear definition of what valve recession is and all the links per, uh, discussed within this video all the sources that are quoted or, or used within this video all these links are going to be provided down in the description below for you to be able to check it out for yourself all right so let's take a look so here i found a article titled Combating Automotive Engine Valve Recession, written by Rob Dyer Joyce and R. Lewis. And looking at Rob Dyer Joyce, his profile here, we can see that he is a PhD professor at the University of Sheffield, and he in the Department of Mechanical Engineering. He has hundreds of publications and citations with ex expertise in the fields of mechanical engineering and all the other different topics listed here. Now, in this research article, uh, starting off in the introduction, it's written here, valve recession occurs when the wear of a valve or the seat insert in an automotive engine has caused the valve to shrink or recede into the seat insert. Excessive recession leads to valves not seating correctly and cylinder pressure loss. Leaking hot combustion gases can also cause valve guttering or torching, which will accelerate valve failure. Now, I know that's a bit of a mouthful, but we're going to take a look at some examples so we can get a better picture of what's actually being discussed here. In this example here, we see valve recession a quite exaggerated example but here on this right valve in comparison to the left one it's receded or sunken into the cylinder head quite far in this particular example uh, the valve recession is caused by damage on the valve itself 
something. There's other examples that we can find where the valve seat, that's the ring that the valve slams up against, recedes into the head. Okay. Now there's other causes for valve damage in, in general, or many different ways a valve can be damaged, either through excessive wear on valve springs, it could be um, excessive wear on the valve cotters. There's a multitude of different reasons why or how valves can have excessive wear on them, right? But in most cases, according to the research, valve recession is caused by excessive wear on the valve seat or the valve itself. In this section of the video, we're going to be taking a look at why valve recession is so dangerous. But in order to understand that, we need to also understand what valve wear or normal valve wear is supposed to look like and also understand why we do valve adjustments in the first place. I encourage you to take a look at, if you have the RX3 manual, to go ahead and come to uh, page 45 in the manual. This is the page that talks about the valve adjustment and I'm giving a general overview of how the valve train in the RX3 works. And the valve adjustment interval for the RX3 is about every 5,000 miles, okay? Now, pretty much the valve adjustment or what the valve adjustment is about, we are adjusting the gap. Let me just zoom in here, all right? We're adjusting the gap between the top of the valve and the valve rocker ball screw here, okay? That gap uh, needs to be set to a certain specific specification. There's usually a range. And for the RX3, the gap has been defined as 0.04 millimeters and 0.08, okay? Now, that gap allows the valves to open and close as the engine spins or the camshaft of the engine spins, right? Now, as, it's, I've, as I've highlighted here, when the engine is at the top of its compression stroke, all the valves are closed. This allows for the compression of the fuel air mixture ignition and the resulting in high combustion pressures will drive the piston down. It's basically how your motorcycle creates power. Now, if any leakage occurs around any of the valves while this is occurring, the engine will lose power and could burn a valve if the combusting fuel air mix escapes around the valve while it's still burning. Okay. Now going down here on the next page, we go continue on. Now what happens is that as this wear occurs, we're talking about normal valve wear, the valve actually moves higher into the cylinder head and the valve gap decreases. If this wear goes beyond acceptable limits without adjusting the valves, that's the limits that are specified here. The valve gap grows smaller and smaller. Ultimately, this wear will result in the valve being held off the seat when combustion occurs. When this condition exists, hot burning gases escape around the valve ceiling area. Ultimately, these burning gases will destroy the valve and the seat. That's what happens when a valve burns. This above undesirable condition is avoided by adjusting the valves. This keeps the gap in the valve train within acceptable range over the life of an engine as a valve in the valve seat wear. We keep everything adjusted so that when the engine is at operating temperature, it still forms a good seal around the valve seat. So as we see, valve wear is a normal occurrence within an, any given engine. And in particular with motorcycle engines, valve adjustments are a normal uh, maintenance item that needs to be performed at any given interval, generally specified by the manufacturer. And for the RX3, in this case, it should be every 5,000 miles. So what makes valve recession so dangerous? Well, valve recession is the condition where normal valve wear, considerably, is actually accelerated 
to the point where we potentially can reach this burn valve condition much sooner than anticipated. And that again, that can be caused by a multitude of different factors, but in most cases, according to research, it's usually due to wear on the valve seat or the valve itself. Coming back to our research article here, as it states, and as we have read earlier, excessive recession leads to valves not sealing correctly and cylinder pressure loss. Leaking hot combustion gases can also cause valve guttering or torching, just like the burn valve condition we just read earlier, which will accelerate valve failure. Here on the second to last page within the research article that was provided, um, we see a chart listed with a various scenarios of how valve recession occurred and what damage uh, happened that caused valve recession. And as we can see, we have different categories here, such as excessive valve wear, so wear on the valve itself. We have excessive seat wear. We have valve fatigue failure. And then we also have uneven seat wear. And then we have the conditions that cause these certain um, issues to happen, right? And I want you guys to just take a closer look and take your time analyzing uh, this chart here. We're definitely going to come back to this chart later on within the video. Um, but um, next, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be taking a look at some examples from my own experience. I'm going to show you guys what happened to my head. We're also going to be looking at some experiences from other RXV owners. And then we're just going to be looking at some other research that's out there in general on this valve recession issue. All right, in this section of the video, we're going to be taking a look at a couple of examples from my own experience. Um, just to summarize certain things, uh, within my experience owning my RX3, I've ex been experiencing valve recession issues for pretty much the entirety of my ownership experience. Uh, my, my particular bike has had uh, two different um, engines, well really uh, two different top ends uh, installed on it. All right, the first engine um, before it was were worked on uh, had 2,273.3 miles on it, right? And we're going to be coming back to uh, the statistics page later on in the, in the video. And but the current engine that I have in there is the engine that's in there now, and the bike in total has a, a little over 7,200 miles on it. But in both instances, um, my bike has been on engine one and engine two has been experiencing valve recession issues. And I have uh, footage and pictures from a video that I post posted up on my uh, YouTube page. And we're gonna be looking at just snippets from the video of this one here named CSCRC, what went wrong and consistencies in my thoughts. You can also uh, view the entire engine teardown it's almost three hours long. And there's also another video uh, called the 6,000 mile long-term review video where I talk about and use some of the snippets of these videos put together. So these snippets are here. Okay, so we first need to understand and, and see what a normal brand new RX3 cylinder head is supposed to look like. and as you guys can see here, the way that the valves sit on the surface, on the brand new head, they sit above this ring here. You can actually see the edge of the valve, okay? And that's pretty much with each one of them. They sit above this kind of edge here. These are the intakes, these are the exhausts, All right? And again, this is a snippet from the video one of the videos. And as you can see here, these are the intake valves, all right? And you can see this, it's kind of recessed here on the, on the edges here, right? It's not above the edge, as you saw, as you see here with a brand new head, it's, it sits below. 
And the same thing is happening with the exhaust valves as well. Okay. And this is when we actually took the valves out. And we can also see that the valve seats themselves have sunken in quite a bit. Okay. These here are the intakes. These here are the exhausts. All right. You see how this lip here has been created. All right. And I know you guys are probably thinking, you know, the wear doesn't really look all that significant. It doesn't look all that bad. And to the naked eye, true. But when we're talking about clearances of hundredths and measurements of hundredths of a millimeter, it really doesn't take much to throw this engine's performance completely off. Here is a website called the China Writers Forums. This is a website that um, hosts discussions about all different types of Chinese made motorcycles. And the RX-3 is spoken about quite um, prevalently with on this forum. And Spud Rider here uh, it was at the time, way back in the day when the RX-3 first came out, he was one of the most avid and most active posters within, within these forum groups. Now, Spud Rider unfortunately also experienced the same issue that I've been experiencing with my RX-3. However, his situation was a bit different. And we'll go on later into pretty much a summary of my whole journey uh, to try to figure out what factors may play a significant role in this issue potentially occurring or what this issue uh, may be about. But just to, to summarize what's going on here from his, for his experience, uh, he states here, since he ever received his RX-3 motorcycle, the valve clearances refused to stabilize. So he needed to adjust the valve clearances every 2,500 miles. And the exhaust valves for him finally stabilized at some point, but the intake valves did not. With about 22,000 miles in the odometer, he reached a point where the intake valves were completely tight, only 1,000 miles after the last valve adjustment. Spud Rider fortunately documented the whole process and we get to see pictures of what his cylinder head looked like and other components look like. Um, obviously the link to all this, these resources, as I stated before, are going to be listed within the description of this video and also on the Facebook group for you to be able to view these um, resources for yourself. But you can see, well, quite more exaggerated in comparison to my head, his valves are quite more recessed in than mine were. Okay, but similar wear, right? And again, I encourage you to go ahead and take a look at this whole uh, thread here. Some really uh, interesting information can be found on this thread. There are other uh, posts um, that you can find on the China Rider forums. You really got to do some digging and searching. I found just a couple that I would also like to list. Um, one user here who was also experiencing uh, performance issues well before the 5,000 mile valve adjustment interval. And then there's another uh, here who was experiencing similar uh, issues also having uh, trouble with valve clearancing clearances um, tightening up well before the valve adjustment interval and we can see here that the valves are quite recessed in the seats are quite quite recessed in okay and lastly here i wanted to share this a web page that I found that has a lot more information about valve recession, uh, in particular when it comes to motorcycles. This uh, web page is called the Motorcycle Project. This is run by a certain individual who has decades of experience working and building uh, different motorcycles, and he has quite a few 
uh, posts and blogs about the topic of valve recession and there's a lot of interesting information that you can find here and I I'm gonna leave as I said before I'm gonna go ahead and leave all the links down in the description you guys can go ahead and check it out all right in this particular portion of the video I want to give a general overview of my history with the RX3 and summarize this valve recession issue that I've been experiencing up to this point. Um, I want to take a look at or I want everyone to understand specifically how the bike was used, how it was maintained, uh, and what factors could have potentially uh, played a role in this issue either developing or occurring. Okay. Because you're going to potentially see a lot of different comments and various posts giving you snippets of information and bits and pieces. So we're just going to do a deep dive all together so that everyone can be on the same page and get a deeper understanding of what potentially could be going on. All right. So to start things off with the factors, here are a list of all the different factors that I have summarized that have been mentioned uh, numerous times either throughout the comments in, mul in a multitude of different posts that I've created uh, up to this point and also certain things that I even came up with uh, trying to do some detective work <laughs> on trying to you know figure out what may be the main cause of this issue and so uh, we're not going to go through um, all these different factors in order but all these particular factors may have play a role to certain degrees um, throughout my ownership experience. And we're going to be coming back and forth uh, to this page here, along with sharing some other information uh, that we're going to be looking at as well. So now um, we're going to be starting by taking a look at my uh, YouTube page. And on my YouTube page, if you can see here, um, I only started posting on YouTube uh, since I done my first valve adjustment, but I've actually been um, documenting about my ownership experience way before then. And if you guys are not a part of the Facebook group, you guys are missing out on some really important information. So if you go ahead and join the CSC Motorcycle Owners Group, um, you'll be able to see posts all the way um, up to when I was actually just received my motorcycle and the posts that I've made uh, since then how I was riding the bike you know doing the break-in process you know doing certain upgrades things of that nature some really important history here all right so when did my valve recession issue first start and according to my valve adjustment um, history here that I have noted it first started at around 1265 miles now I must confess that in the beginning I didn't necessarily know that this was a like main issue or a big issue with the bike I didn't I wasn't I didn't quite understand what was going on at the time I truly and honestly believed that maybe I was just doing something wrong, you know, in the beginning, you know, I thought that maybe I just didn't set them right or do something right. Maybe could have been a multitude of different things, but either way, uh, this is also the reason why it is that I didn't uh, make videos about it in the very beginning. Uh, I did make a video uh, that's shown here, the reliability reality check. This is when I had to adjust them again at 1,421 miles. And that's, that's that uh, video. But this is also when um, one of the valve cover bolts was actually stripped <laughs> because I was you know, trying to do a, a, a valve clearance job. Okay. I set the valves again um, and during this time I also have to mention uh, on the first engine 
the valves were always set to 0.06 millimeters. Okay, I set them to 0.06 millimeters because that was right smack dab in the middle between the specified uh, tolerance that was shown in the manual. The, the specified uh, tolerance is anywhere between 0.04 and 0.08. So I thought putting them smack dab in the middle would give me, you know, kind of the best of both worlds at the, at the time. I didn't want them to be too wide and I also didn't want it to be too small. Okay, so moving on, um, I went ahead and, and adjusted them again because we experienced the same issues again. The, the main issues that I was experiencing at this time was poor MPG performance, stalling, uh, high idle, typical things of that nature. We finally get to this point here at 1905.8 miles is when I finally was uh, acknowledged the issue as, you know, there's something going on. And that is this video here, the CSC Arx3 running like crap video. Okay. And after the release of this video, this is when we started to, uh, seriously look into this issue and, and, and acknowledge it as something that needed to be documented in a very detailed fashion. So ever since this video here, this is when the, really when the whole saga began of, of the doc, the documented <laughs> portion of it. Um, I have instances where it occurred prior to, prior to this, but from here on is where we're, you're going to find the most documented information about it. So now that we understand when the valve recession first started to occur and when we start to document about it, um, a lot of these different factors started to rise up and just questions that we that I wanted to, you know, be, be answered. What could be the general cause of what's going on? So the very first thing uh, was uh, improper valve adjustment technique number six so either we weren't tightening the lock tight tight enough or we weren't on top dead center and so just like I I've thought to myself before you know maybe I was just doing something wrong and so that's what we did right after uh, this video the CSE actually run like crap video we released two videos where I showed in explicit detail um, my entire process of how I tore the bike down uh, and also how I reached top dead center. I also showed some documentation and some videos, things of that nature of, of uh, how I learned how to reach top dead center. Because reaching top dead center, at least in the RX3 service manual, it's not really detailed or described. Um, the motorcycle that I owned before owning my RX3, uh, I was still a decently fairly new owner, but my very first motorcycle as shown here in the CSC Motorcycle Owners Group uh, was actually a TT250. And I didn't have this bike for long, but I did have to do a valve adjustment on this bike. And so the valve adjustment video uh, at the time that was out and I think still to this day is the only video really that's out there on the CSC channel that shows how valve adjustments are done on this particular motorcycle. Uh, I watched that. I understood the concept of how to reach top dead center along with some other videos, just getting a general understanding of how a, the motorcycle engines work in, in that regard. I did the valve adjustment on my TD250 and it ran fine. Um, I applied those same concepts to the RX3 that I learned and I showed all that within this video. The video got a response from the community within the Facebook group, also a response from CSC themselves. They said I was doing everything just fine in that regard. So then we moved on to the second portion of the video. The second portion of the video is where I showed in explicit detail um, how I actually adjust the valve. So going in there with the feeler gauge, locking the, lo the lock nuts down and putting the bike back together. And we wrote it after that for an additional, 
let's see here, 180 miles. And we were right back in square one again, where we had to uh, adjust the valves again. And that video is going to be this one here, where we wanted to experiment with a wider valve gap adjustment. Okay. Also within this video, we ad address the other factor of me not locking the Loctite nuts down enough. So I actually, in this video, use as much force as I could <laughs> to make sure that they stay put. Um, CSC later then, uh, you know, responded to me that that's un unnecessary. And yeah, it's, it's unnecessary for you to almost strip your lock nuts. It's just, that's not the, the real issue. And we went ahead and rode a, an additional um, 180 miles. And we were finally stopped at 2,273.3 miles on the first engine. Okay. Here's a snippet of the video here, the engine inspection mystery solved. And as you guys can see, the mileage was at 2273.3. And then uh, later on in this video, we actually take a look with the bore snake camera to see what was going on with one of the valves. And at the time, um, yeah, the, the video quality wasn't the best, but we were able to see this speck here, this little angle that didn't look right. Um, looked like some deformation on the, on the face of the valve here. Like it was damaged in some way. CSC actually took a look at this video and they recommended that I bring the bike in to have them take a look at it so that way we can see what's going on and they would replace whatever components seem to be necessary so that I can be on my way and have this issue resolved. Having that response from CSC, I went ahead and got the bike all uh, loaded up on my truck about a couple days later we made the trip all the way down the csc and we had the bike worked on by carlos csc once they took the engine apart they did their inspections they had their opinions um, we went ahead and got the engine rebuilt back together they advised me that i should do an engine break-in process all over again so pretty much there it's pretty much like a new engine Okay, not entirely, but pretty much like a new engine. And this is why in a lot of my posts, I name it as such because I've, all, I've treated it as such. And that's when we started to document again in full detail because now I was curious whether or not uh, the issue occurred due to me just getting, you know, a bad apple or whether there was other factors in play. All right, before we go move on here, I wanted to go over uh, these factors to see how they could have played a role with um, the issue developing within the first engine. Now, we already outruled this factor here, number six. Um, we already saw the engine technique was documented in explicit detail. I got feedback from CSC and from the community uh, unanimously agreeing that my valve adjustment technique, reaching top dead center, things of that nature was correct. I also learned from Sifu once I actually visited how to uh, conduct it as well. Improper engine break-in. Uh, again, my engine break-in process was not documented in explicit detail uh, as it is with the second engine. However, I did, de uh, I did make posts about it uh, with all my Facebook within the Facebook group. So uh, I was riding at 5,000 RPMs and below, anywhere between 35 to 50 miles an hour. And uh, at the time, uh, I was just going off of Jeep. You know, what was the indicated speed? I didn't necessarily know <laughs> how fast the bike was actually going at the time. Um, later on in this post here, Again, I was putting miles on the bike for the engine break-in process, and this is the day where I actually found out that the speedometer was off. So 
the bike was ridden at 5,000 RPMs and below for the entirety of the engine break-in process. And that's been documented within the Facebook group along with other maintenances and upgrades that have been uh, gone on. Okay, so this factor as well, uh, improper engine break-in. You guys can take a look at the Facebook post. Uh, that factor here is outruled as well. Now, improper maintenance in, in general. Um, again, everything has been documented and we can actually take a look at my maintenance log here. So this maintenance log actually corresponds to and uh, kind of aligns with a lot of the Facebook posts that I would that actually did. So these dates, there's most likely a Facebook post that has the same date <laughs> where you can actually see exactly what happened and you know all the maintenance that was done at these documented uh, time frames and it's color coded to show uh, what maintenances were upgrades and new components added to the bike like tall seats center stand things of that nature green is oil changes filters changes the red is for valve adjustments or other major maintenance. Okay. Uh, the orange is for minor maintenances such as adjusting, cleaning, lubricating things. And then the pink is for scheduled maintenances. So uh, generally speaking, when it comes to the pink, it's usually for um, major maintenances, but anything that's scheduled. So for this example here, like my first valve adjustment. Yes, it's a major maintenance, but because it's scheduled, it's together with the pink. All the other um, red star occurrences that just have like it being alone, that's when we had to prematurely adjust the valves due to performance issues. All right, but uh, once again, all the maintenance is listed here as far as oil changes and lubricating of things. Uh, I would actually have to argue that I, especially when it comes to oil changes, I've done oil changes quite more frequently than uh, what's actually recommended due to various reasons. Um, like here, the oil was actually extremely dirty as shown in, yeah, this, this is here, <laughs> okay? And, uh, Later on, at the 500, after the 500 mile maintenance, um, I changed the oil again, and then I changed the oil again at 958 miles. We then changed the oil one more time at 1300 miles because we wanted to switch over to synthetic. And I think the longest interval uh, as of to date this is on engine two now uh, over here the longest interval that we've had was about 1700 miles as we see here every other um, mileage interval has been below 1700 miles even to this day um, with the more it's averages anywhere between uh, 800 to 1000 okay so with the factor of improper maintenance in general, I'm also gonna to have to outrule that factor there. So for the remainder of this video, we're gonna be focusing on these four main factors on top here, okay? And with different experiments that I've conducted on the second engine, we're, we're gonna see how these factors have played a role in the issue overall. But in regards to the first engine, um, the bike, in the beginning, uh, I did. I wasn't necessarily riding it um, all the time. I think before 1,265 miles, the bike was actually ridden uh, quite infrequently. Uh, I didn't start my new job position at the time, and this is where we have uh, this YouTube video. Um, should you the last day of work? Okay. And during this this period of time, this is when I uh, left my previous job 
and I had a bit of a hiatus to run experiments with the bike to improve its overall MPG performance and kind of fiddle with it to, to fit my use case. And for a lot of these different experiments that we did, uh, we tested the MPG experiments, whether it was ridden at highway speeds and also ridden on my uh, commute route, the, the route that I would be having, that I would ride on for my new job position, okay? And we conducted a lot of these different experiments and I also generally use the bike again very infrequently to run little errands around town so we didn't necessarily start riding the bike every single day right so as far as frequency of use for the first for the first thousand a little over a thousand miles the frequency of use was quite low right the intensity moderate the distance was sporadic and the weight of the bike or the load on the bike was consistent the bike had it was in its relatively stock configuration i only had a couple of upgrades uh, on the bike and me as a rider i'm 65 300 pounds but during that experimental phase we were putting the bike together to see how it would perform best with myself on it. I found that lowering the gearing um, got me the best results as far as MPG performance is concerned for my use case. And then we continued, then we actually started to use the bike to ride to work consistently. Once we did started to ride the bike to work very consistently, that's when we started to see uh, some of these issues uh, arise more frequently. This is when we started to have to do valve adjustments literally on average every three days. Because my commute route is 60 miles a day, riding at 7,000 RPM with the lowered gearing, that would be at 55 miles an hour GPS, as you guys can probably find in lots of my older Facebook posts. And knowing that we conducted all those MPG experiments and also including the last day of work highway ride, uh, the total amount of highway miles that I have accumulated on engine number one was 205 highway miles. And out of the total 2,273.3 miles I had on the first engine before it was uh, rebuilt or replaced, uh, only 9% of the total mileage was highway miles. It's, it's very important to note and also the valve adjustment gap like we stated before was at 0 0.06 millimeters until the very last valve ad gap adjustment at 0 0.08 okay so all these statistics here are very important to note so that way we can pinpoint what factors played a role uh, and how heavily some of these factors played a role with potentially developing or having this issue uh, arise. So as far as the weight is concerned, especially with the first engine, uh, the weight was consistent, it was unchanged. Distance, mm, once we actually started uh, commuting to work, which is 60 miles a day, that's when we started to see the, uh, the most uh, occurrences of this issue arising. Intensity was also the same at 60 miles a day, 7,000 RPM, or 55 miles an hour at 7,000 RPM. And frequency of use, once it became daily, that's when we started to see these issues. All right. Here's a snippet from one of my videos on my YouTube channel called Should You Buy a CSC Motorcycle to Save Money on Gas? This is where I talked about my thought process, what led me to buy a CSC motorcycle for my commuting needs. And in this video here, as you can see for the RX-3, I, I posted up the actual spec sheet for the RX-3 that was available at the time. And even before uh, 
my, when I actually purchased the bike. And you can see here the gross vehicle weight rating along with the load capacity is not listed for the RX-3 and neither was it listed in any other documentation that I can find uh, on the internet. But to this day, if you actually go into the website today, um, you can find the load capacity listed here as 330 pounds. All right, so if you actually watch this video, I go into explicit detail where I itemize all of the upgrades I ever added to the bike. And we figured out that by calculating the gross vehicle weight rating, that is, according to the gross vehicle weight rating, I was actually overloading the bike on my daily commute by about 69 pounds. Okay, that's when it was a full gas tank, um, less when I had less uh, gas in the tank. And some of those statistics are also shown uh, here. Let me go ahead and unzoom out. Yeah, so depending on how much gas I had in the tank, it was anywhere between this amount, okay? So what we did according, and again, this is according to the gross vehicle weight rating, not the actual weight limit of the bike. Um, what we did is we went ahead and stripped the bike down completely of every bolt, every nut, every fender, all the boxes, all the crash guards, the windscreen, the skid plate, the, everything that I could think of to take off of the bike, I took it off to shed as much weight as possible. And we conducted a weight reduction experiment. Here's a snippet from the weight reduction experiment video where I show you the results of everything that I took off. I took off, as you can see, the windshield, uh, the all every single fender that you can think of, chain guard, uh, the top box, the crash guards, the boxes, the skid plate, everything that you can think of that could be taken off, I took it off. I did leave my hand guards on because I didn't want bugs to be splattering up against my fingers, but. I took everything off that you can imagine, and in total, we lost around 72 pounds, um, well over 70 pounds worth of weight. And that, with that, that allowed me to be well within the weight limits of the bike according to the GVWR. Okay? Depending on how much gas I had in the gas tank, I was about. Um, half a pound under all the way down to 16 pounds under but now now we know what the actual low capacity of the bike is and uh, i was actually well within the actual weight limits of the bike realistically speaking nonetheless we conducted the experiment here's also a snippet from one of the weight reduction experiment videos where i showed uh in explicit detail um you guys rode along with me for pretty much the in entirety of the commute that I have been doing ever since I started riding the motorcycle to work. It's been pretty much the same uh, route. I was riding at about 55 miles an hour GPS at 7,000 RPM, as you can see. Um, and throughout the entirety of the weight reduction experiment, we were measuring the typical signs of uh, valves getting too tight. This was uh, poor MPG performance, higher idle, also uh, the exhaust note change, and overall power loss. We were pretty much monitoring all those different metrics. And at the end of each video, or every day that I did ride, I, I went ahead and filled back up on gas so we can get MPG results. And we also monitored at the end of each ride uh, how the bike was running um, at the, the idle speeds. We observed over the course of the entire week how the uh, engine idle speeds actually increased steadily okay and you can go to the uh, WRE results video to see the overall results of how what the valves actually look like 
uh, how tight they actually got, and also the performance figures uh, over the entirety of the experiment. But pretty much, we saw the consistent signs of valves getting tighter over the entirety of this week that we were riding. And so, at the end of it all, the valves did get tighter, and I went ahead and ruled out this factor of weight playing a role in the issue. Had it played a role um, losing over 70 pounds, effectively uh, making myself a 230 pound rider almost overnight, <laughs> um, we should have seen some type of uh, results with keeping all these other factors the same. Distance travel was the same, intensity was the same, and frequency of use was unchanged. Changing the factor of weight drastically didn't didn't change uh, the overall performance at all. Okay. The next factor that we decided to uh, run an experiment on was the intensity factor, in specific, the RPMs. It was um, the public opinion that riding the bike at 7,000 RPMs every day uh, was too high. And um, at the time, especially prior to buying this motorcycle, it was touted within the forums and also within uh, the, the user groups that the RX-3 was famous for the 5,000 mile adventure ride that was conducted by Joe Burke, who used to work for CSC uh, and be their kind of uh, engineer and public relations uh, middleman at the time. Um, we went ahead and took a deep dive in the 5,000 miles at 8,000 RPM book along with some information that I could find out there about Joe Burke and his story in this video here, which I really encourage that you watch so that way you can see with your own eyes yourself exactly what the 5,000 miles at 8,000 RPM book states. We don't go through the whole thing, but we do go over certain key details about that trip um, because it's very important to know the very reason why it is that the RX-3 has 5,000 mile valve adjustment intervals is because of the, the results of that adventure ride. So in essence, the valve clearance durability claim for the RX-3 is indeed 5,000 miles at 8,000 RPM. And I believed riding a bike at 7,000 RPM wasn't going to be wasn't an issue based on them riding 5,000 miles at 8,000 RPM. Okay, and s stating that the bike had no issues over the entirety of the ride. All right. Um, so again, at the at the time, I believed exactly what others uh, were stating that they did. They were saying that they ride on the highway all the time. They were saying that they, uh, you know, done very long distance uh, travel and uh, things of that nature. So I, th I really didn't believe that riding at 7,000 RPMs was an issue or riding at 55 miles an hour was an issue. But nonetheless, we went ahead and uh, put the stock gearing back on the bike so we could measure the effects of what lower RPMs could have on the power recession issue. All right, here's a snippet of the stock gearing experiment part one video. Um, initially, in the beginning, I rode the bike at the same speed, so maintaining 55 miles an hour GPS. And I noticed that, as you guys can see here, the RPMs between the stock uh, front sprocket and the lowered gearing stock uh, front sprocket, it's only a difference in 500 RPMs. So for the remainder of the week, instead of riding at 55 miles an hour, I decided to ride at 6,000 RPMs. And we'll see that here later on. All right, so here's a snippet of the SGE um, part two video and every other video 
after that was written in the same manner, I decided to write at 6,000 RPMs instead of 6,500 RPMs because I really didn't believe that there was going to be a difference between 6,500 and 7,000. So I went ahead and started to write a little bit lower um, so that way we can measure results to see if the 1,000 RPM difference would make a, a huge change or have a huge effect on the overall uh, valve recession issue that I was experiencing. We actually rode the entire week and the symptoms that we um, measured were quite different from uh, the weight reduction experiment. With the weight reduction experiment, the symptoms that we measured was a lower MPG performance, a higher idle, and um, the exhaust note changing and top end performance loss. Now with the SGE experiment, uh, because we were riding so slow on the back roads, um, I never had the opportunity to pass anybody and I never, I didn't even want to. <laughs> so we didn't test top end performance at all, but MPG wise, we actually got really good MPG performance um, from a lot of these days. I think the lowest we got was about 57 MPG or something like that nature. Um, idle uh, speeds were also quite consistent around 1500 to 15, uh, 1550. However, the exhaust note by the end of the week also changed. And then later on, um, I, the bike started to stall. It's also a common symptom of valves getting a bit too tight. Okay. So then I went ahead and opened the engine up here in this video, the SGE update. And sadly, uh, we found that the valves tightened up once again. So with the SGE experiment, we were able to single out, uh, at least here, this factor, the intensity, uh, RPMs and speed to a certain degree. Now the RPM difference that we were riding at was not drastic, like there wasn't a drastic change, but it was a change nonetheless. And we saw no difference with uh, changing this factor alone um, in comparison to the others. The frequency of use, still the same, ridden every single day, distance, still the same, 60 miles. And the weight, um, in comparison to the weight reduction experiment, it was just a little bit different. Um, when the rate reduction experiment, the bike was about 70, over 70 pounds lighter than a standard RX-3. Um, the bike for the stock gearing experiment uh, was actually a little, I put some of the accessories back on the bike. So I, I put the windshield back on, I put the top box back on and certain other, uh, I think that was pretty much it. I just wanted to have some storage. Oh, I also put the pillion seat back on. Um, so I can have a little bit of comfort because after getting the results from the weight reduction experiment, once we ruled this out, that it doesn't matter. I just put, I just wanted to ride the bike to be, I wanted to be the bike to be comfortable uh, during the next experiment. But the bike was still about uh, 45 to 50 pounds lighter than a standard RX-3 during the standard gearing experiment. Okay. And now we saw that intensity didn't really play that much of a role, right? Um, and I have to be honest, you know, riding a 250cc motorcycle uh, here in America, that is, you know, if, if the bike couldn't do at least 50 miles an hour consistently or couldn't do 50 miles an hour reliably, if intensity truly was the main issue and riding to 50 miles an hour was too much for most American applications, the RX-3 is just outruled as a commuter bike. It's, I think it's, I don't think it's too demanding to, uh, to expect a 250 CC motorcycle to be able to be ridden at 50 to 55 miles an hour daily. Um, if I wanted to, you know, a vehicle that can only go, you know, 40, 45 miles an hour, you could just get a scooter. All right, so once we tested these main two factors here, weight and intensity, 
uh, RPMs or speed. Once we tested these two with those experiments and found out the results that it didn't uh, change anything, um, I almost pretty much lost hope, you know? And nonetheless, uh, we continued on uh, with certain um, suggestions that were within the group as well. Uh, someone suggested that I should do an oil analysis on the bike. So we did, we collected the oil, and this oil was in the bike during the SGE experiment, also in the bike during the WRE experiment, and even a bit of the ultimate endurance test. Okay, so we know, we knew for sure that the oil that was in the bike uh, was used while the bike was experiencing valve session issues. And we wanted to know whether or not uh, these valve recession issues were due to uh, other valve train components wearing excessively or something else. So we sent that analysis in and later on we got the results which we'll talk about later. And once this also happened, um, I, I initially spoke about uh, within my 6,000 mile review video, at the very end of this video, I was conducting one other experiment. I was I was wanting to experiment with uh, increasing the valve gap beyond the specified uh, spec to see whether or not that would give me any type of increased durability. Because as we have observed with previously, uh, in between the first engine and the second engine, the majority of these gaps here, I was able to go about almost double the uh, distance before needing to give the valves attention. Okay. And right after, really at this point here, this valve adjustment here, at uh, that that was at the end of the SGE update. This is when I wanted to experiment with the 0 0.102 millimeter gap. Okay. But uh, life happened, right? Uh, instead of being able to ride the bike in the same manner under the same conditions of, you know, 60 miles a day every single day um my father passed away which was the unexpected uh, life event i stopped going to work for a little while you know i was on bereavement and um yeah i was away dealing with uh you know his affairs and still and traveling back and forth to los angeles using my other vehicles so the bike wasn't ridden very often and it went on for about a month but unintentionally uh, this little experiment or this uh, time frame I was able to single out this factor here frequency of use okay um, at the end of a little over a month we still managed to uh, rack up about 300 miles on the bike okay and so the overall distance was unchanged and there was about two rides um, two commutes back and forth from work there was lots of running around town kind of infrequently it wasn't every single day and there was another ride where I visited um, family uh, or and around and over the span of a month we we racked up about 300 miles but i was riding very inconsistently basically i was exhibiting the typical riding habits of the typical motorcycle owner because up to this point riding 60 miles a day um and i was averaging about 1300 miles a month and if you do the math that's over 15,000 miles a year 
on the bike. Okay, most motorcycle owners only ride about three to four thousand miles a year, and the overwhelming majority of RX3 owners, especially the ones that are not exhibiting this issue, um, they have those riding habits. Okay, and this was the first experiment that was conducted where I pretty much exhibited the same riding habits of a typical rider riding about uh, 300 miles a month where my frequency of use was drastically reduced still covered about over measured over the distance of about 300 miles the weight was unchanged during this experiment uh, the same as the SGE experiment I still had uh, my top box and really nothing else and the intensity was also relatively unchanged. I still had those two rides back and forth from work. And then I had many infrequent rides around town and even visiting, as I mentioned before. So intensity, RPMs, and speed also relatively unchanged. All right, so now we move forward to where uh, I make the decision <laughs> to ride all the way to Los Angeles. So I wanted to test and single out this factor here of intensity, but to the extreme, all right? And the intensity here was measured with the new valve or experimental valve gap adjustment of 0 0.102 millimeters. Okay, we rode a total of 320 miles, riding anywhere between seven to 9,000 RPM, mostly around 8,000 RPM, generally speaking. Um, so the bike was consistently at the top end of the rev range. Uh, we got a pretty consistent around 50 miles to the gallon on the highway, or a little over. And yeah, uh, at the end of the trip, we did a midweek or mid road trip uh, valve inspection just to see how the valves held up after riding 300 miles in one day. Okay. And so far, with all of these experiments that we've conducted, they've all been uh, measured within. Um, you know, sections and distances of 300 miles. Okay. And that's mainly due to the wear or the valve wear that we've been seeing uh, on this second engine so far, especially with adjusting it to this millimeter gap. Okay. And I also want to note that before we started this highway trip, okay. Uh, this is all the miles that I accumulated on the, the second engine um, up to this point at the end of the SGE experiment. Okay. And I want to make sure that it's mentioned here uh, that the amount of highway miles that I actually rode, this is the through the entirety of all the UET updates ever since the, the new engine was installed in the bike until this mileage here. Um, and to the end of the SGE experiments, uh, this is the amount of highway miles that I had on the bike. So only 5.6% of the total mileage that I accumulated on the bike was highway miles. Um, I'm mentioning this because, um, again, you might go through older posts and you might see certain remarks of folks um, claiming that the reason why this issue has developed was because the bike was ridden at red line on the highway all the time, okay? I've shown you guys through the SGE experiment and with the WRE experiment exactly how the bike was ridden on my commute route. I actually have dozens of videos of how my, the bike was ridden on my commute route, um, whether it was the MPG experiments, and even uh, other experiments where uh, 
or just in general where I just showed me riding on my commute route like this one here relaxing ride to work so this claim that the bike was consistently ridden uh, all the time for hours on end uh, on the highway and that's why this issue occurred is simply not true you know, only 5.6 percent of the total miles were highway miles and with the first engine uh, the percentage is a bit higher because the miles that we've accumulated overall was lower but the overall miles that were ridden on the highway was almost identical 205 with engine one and 198 with engine two okay i'm only I'm, again i'm stating this mainly because uh i want to ensure that the information is accurate okay the the development of the valve session issue was not due to riding on the highway all the time it was me riding uh my commute route at 55 miles an hour all right now once i actually did do this highway experiment okay the highway experiment um, in total, well, the amount of miles that was actually ridden on the highway increased my total highway miles to 837. But even with the total mileage that's on the bike thus far at the time of me making this video, um, and this is the amount of miles that I have on the new engine uh, or engine two at the time of me making this video, uh, the total percentage of highway miles is 16.8%. Okay. All right. So here we did the mid road trip valve inspection and we found that the intake valves really didn't move at all, maybe slightly. And the exhaust valves moved a bit, but they were still well within spec. They were somewhere between 0 0.08 millimeters and 0 0.09 millimeters. So overall the experiment was a success. I actually succeeded in increasing the valve gap durability by going beyond spec. Obviously we still saw movement, but I could have easily gone um, an additional, you know, potentially 300 miles without really needing to give valves attention, which was great. That was great news. And while I was on my trip in uh, uh, LA, I also got an email back from the oil analysis that gave us the results. And the oil analysis results that we got back, um, I'll show you guys a picture of it here in just a second. All right, here is a copy of my Blackstone Laboratories oil analysis report. Obviously I have blacked out these uh, line items here of personal information, but uh, we do get to see it's the Zongshan NC250 gasoline uh, the oil had 876 miles on it, synthetic oil, uh, 2021 RX-3. Okay, so we, if we go to the, if you go to that video of the oil analysis results, okay, I go in explicit detail on what all these things mean, but on average, these are all the uh, values that I received within my bike listed here okay and in comparison to the universal averages my numbers look great and here are the comments from blackstone laboratories stating we don't know a lot about this engine but we have seen a handful of samples from others with the same type those other samples are average in the universal averages column that's here um, and show typical wear levels after about 1100 miles in the oil Valve issues would likely show up as elevated iron and your iron is okay. Pretty much where we'd expect it to be. Other metals look good too. We found no significant contamination in the oil. The TBN is still strong at 4.5. Lots of active additive left. And solubles are nice and low. Looks good from here. So the oil analysis didn't give us any definitive results to uh, tell us that the valve recession issue is placed within certain components within the valve train. The oil analysis also gave us 
well, really decent results that the bike is running just fine. So in pretty much in conjunction with the SGE experiment, the WRE experiment, the ultimate endurance test experiment, um, the bike is running normally the way that it should be. Okay. Even though during those experiments, we def definitely experience valve recession. We know that the valve recession is not due to um, other valve train components excessively wearing. Otherwise, we would have seen those um, uh, metal shavings within the oil in itself. Also, if the bike was struggling uh, due to weight or uh, me riding it the way that I was riding it at 55 miles an hour, we also would have seen elevated levels of something of excessive wear. Uh, within the oil and everything was in uh, normal ranges in fact actually lower in most cases as you see here iron and aluminum lower in most cases than the universal averages and finally uh, we rode back from Los Angeles after my trip was over and that was another over 300 mile long trip with riding in the same conditions uh, this time the the valves as we showed here in this video post road trip maintenance i take a look at the valves again and um, because at the end of this trip or towards the end of this trip um, i was experiencing a little bit worse gas mileage just a tiny bit Gen generally speaking riding on the highway at the highway speeds I was averaging a little over 50 mpg and even in the beginning of uh, the total ride i was averaging over 50 mpg but only towards the very end of the trip the last two gas stations did i start to see mpg figures like 44.8 and 43 mpg which was quite lower uh, which i suspected that the valves were getting a bit tighter and we saw uh, in this video that after opening the valves up we then saw that the one of the intake valves just one of them uh, the left one <laughs> in particular uh, was quite tight it was um, not extremely but um, it was even tighter than the 0 0.08 uh, millimeter uh, gauge I had to go down to 0 0.063 uh, to get a feel for it all right and so from those results um, the ex the expanded valve gap clearance still is quite successful and I mean we were testing we really did this intensity test twice and that was to the extreme obviously um, I'm most likely never going to be riding on the highway in that type of manner ever again. <laughs> but uh, it was good to see how extending the valve clearance um, and, uh, gap, how the bike would perform if I really needed to use it in that type of manner. All right. So that brings us to the current day, where we're at now. And the experiment that I'm conducting now is I'm trying to figure out how my experimental valve gap clearance of uh, 0.102, how that will, uh, you know, perform with riding my commute route, okay? 60 miles a day uh, at 50 miles an hour uh, GPS or 55 miles an hour GPS uh, in between there and uh, I still have stock gearing on the bike from the stock gearing experiment so that's anywhere between 6 to 6500 RPM uh, the weight the weight has increased slightly I did put the um, the panniers back on the bike uh, however the fairings and the skid plate and a lot of other different things are still not on the bike um, more due to convenience reasons uh, 
mainly because having to service the valves so frequently I just didn't didn't see the point in putting it back on knowing that literally after a week or two weeks or however often I needed to go in there I was just gonna have to do it all over again so you know uh, you know take them off and put them back on all over again so leaving the bike in the configuration that I have it now which uh, is shown in this video here okay um, started to get obviously it's it's taken apart but I still have the I have the boxes now the top box as well on there and um, I still have all the fenders and fairings off of the bike you know as you can see here in this clip okay now this leaving in this configuration allows me much easier access to the to service the valves all I have to do is undo uh, the back seat take two bolts out to take this seat off undo the tank and I can get access to the intake valves uh, unbolt this radiator here and undo move the radiator out on the other side as well and or and uh, to give me a little bit of clearance to be able to get to the valve cover there it's just a lot less work than needs to be done uh, I could do a valve adjustment on the bike in this configuration in like 30 minutes or maybe even 20 minutes it's, it, yeah, I've gotten so good at it now it's it's ridiculous I've done almost 15 valve adjustments up to this point <laughs> so there you have it that's where we are at up at this point I hope everybody is caught up and that's pretty much the next experiment that I am conducting hopefully the uh, valves will hold for a much longer period of time um, with this experimental valve gap I'm hoping and uh, yeah so we're pretty much keeping all these other factors the same by just increasing the valve gap and we're going to see them what the results look like all right, finally towards the end of the video, wrapping things up in this conclusion here. So hopefully throughout this entire video, we were able to summarize and, and you guys got an understanding of what valve recession really is, uh, what usually causes valve recession, uh, why it's so dangerous. You got to an in-depth look in on what valve recession looked like on my bike, at least for the first engine or the first head. We also looked at some experiences from other RX3 owners out there that we can find on the China Riders forums. We looked at some publications and some research about the topic and the issue from various sources. I also gave you an in-depth summary of my entire experience with this valve recession issue up to this point and now we come to the conclusion you know based on the evidence based on the research based on the collective experience from other rx3 owners and other motorcycle owners out there in general based on the actual facts and the research my theory to why this issue is happening and especially with the wear that we have seen on the head, not only mine, but also others. Um, my theory is that the uh, head stiffness is too low. Okay. So we're having, we're seeing excessive valve wear due to sliding, which is poor valve design head stiffness too low we have to redesign the head another uh, potential um, or what I believe another potential reason is that we're having excessive valve wear due to impact material not being suitable the hardness being too low okay and we can select new material right and this is just based on the research that's out there and all the experiments that we've conducted, right? We saw how the bike reacted to manipulating certain factors. And we also know what certain factors play the biggest role in this issue potentially occurring, which is quite odd that frequency of use 
uh, seems to be the biggest factor uh, for this issue. And so I guess I want to leave you guys with this. Okay. If you're someone who owns an RX3, okay, and you don't ride it every day, that's going to give you the best chance at not developing this issue. All right. Now, I don't necessarily know whether or not this issue is uh, just a general issue across the board with everybody's bike. I Personally, it's hard for me to believe that I literally got potentially got two bad heads back to back, um, especially with riding the bike in the exact same manner uh, under the exact same circumstances. It's it's just I just think it's highly unlikely that I just got two bad apples. So this is why I'm leaning more towards the material in itself. Uh, just being too low quality um, however from the experiments that I conducted um, throughout my experience I've come to the conclusion and figured out that the writing uh, frequency um, is what plays the biggest factor in this issue uh, potentially occurring so if you're someone who is the typical average writer you don't have to worry too much. I'm not necessarily outruling the other factors completely. I'm, I'm pretty sure that they still play a role to a certain degree, but definitely frequency of use is going to be something that you want to uh, minimize as much as possible to mitigate this issue from occurring. Okay. So, uh, if you are thinking about buying this bike to be a commuter bike, I would advise you not to. Uh, you'd be better off buying a motorcycle from a much more reputable manufacturer that has a great track record of actually being used in that type of application. Okay. It's not uncommon for small displacement motorcycles to be used in certain applications as commuter bikes but for some reason with this rx3 when it's used in that manner uh, we tend to see this go on <laughs> okay and um, I don't know the experience of others who have accumulated the same problem I don't know necessarily what their riding habits have been like um, you guys can go to those links down below and see all the different research and see all the different experiences from others. Um, but I hope my shared experience uh, gives you guys a bit of clarity and understanding so that you can be very knowledgeable <laughs> and, and very educated in your decision to potentially buy an RX3 or how you should go about your RX3 ownership if you are currently an RX3 owner. All right. So until next time, guys, stay safe out there and peace.